Yeah. Hello, thanks for being here. My name is Adam van Wiedem, and I'm here to talk about the DNA of Bitcoin. So, Bitcoin is cypherpunk. First of all, who am I? This is also not working. The clicker is not working. Let's see. Ah, that's awkward. Hello, hello. Uh, okay, I'll just go on for now. So my name is Arne Verwirrem, I'm a Bitcoin journalist. Uh, I've been writing about Bitcoin for over 10 years. Uh, yeah, so I, I was... Uh, this is annoying. I do need the slides, kind of. Is there anyone... Should I run back? What should I do here? Slides are coming. He's working on it? Should I wait? Alright, I'll wait a second. Well, I can mention, yeah, so I'm a Bitcoin journalist. I've been working, I've been writing about Bitcoin for over 10 years. I was the technical editor of Bitcoin magazine. Uh, so I was covering, for example, the block size wars. I was very involved in that, uh, which was an interesting time to be a Bitcoin journalist because it was really a debate about the future of Bitcoin, sort of the vision for Bitcoin. Where is Bitcoin going? What trade-offs are we going to make with Bitcoin? Uh, but I'm also a historian. So before Bitcoin, I, was, uh, I studied history. And the reason why I wanted to study history is because I thought the best way to understand the world, or the best way to understand how we got to our current situation, is to understand how we got here. And a couple of years ago, I decided I wanted to apply that same logic to Bitcoin. So to really understand Bitcoin, I figured you need to understand where it came from. Uh, I, start, I decided to write a book on this. This book is called The Genesis Book. So the Genesis book is about the prehistory of Bitcoin. It, it tells the story of the people and projects that inspired Bitcoin and how we got to Bitcoin. All right, from this point on, I really am going to need slides. So they are working on it. Let's hang on. Technical difficulties. There we go. So yeah, that's the... Yes, so this is who I am. I just went over this slide. So a big part of the book and a big part of Bitcoin's prehistory are the cipher parts. So who are the cypherpunks? The story starts in 1992. So for context, personal, personal computers just started popping up in people's homes. And also the internet is very new. So innovative techies start to experiment, explore, work with the internet. Three of these techies were Tim May, Eric Hughes, and John Gilmore. That's Tim May, Eric Hughes, and John Gilbert. This, is, uh, this was a Wired magazine cover, so they're wearing masks, you can't recognize them, but trust me, these are Tim May, Eric Hughes, and John Gilmore. Tim May was a retired Intel physicist. He, he retired very young, in his 30s, and he bought a home in a Californian coast town, and there he started to study, read papers, read technical papers, study economics as well, uh, reading cyberpunk novels, he wanted to write one eventually, uh, one day he was visited by his friend Eric Hughes. Eric Hughes had just worked at a startup, a digital cash startup in Amsterdam called DigiCash. I'll get back to that in a minute. That's an important part of the story. So he worked there, he came back to, to the United States, he met with his friend Tim May, and the two of them started to discuss the internet, the potential of the internet, and also importantly, cryptography. So 15 years earlier, there had been a big breakthrough in the field of cryptography. For most of human history, if people wanted to communicate privately, they needed to share a key. So militaries, for example, they, communi they communicated through symmetric encryption. Now the difficult so what that means is you have a secret key, you take information, you encrypt it, and then with the same key you decrypt it. It's the same key used. Now this was not very viable for the internet if you want to communicate privately. You can't meet everyone on the internet before you can start to communicate privately. So the big breakthrough in the field of cryptography was public key cryptography. With public key cryptography, you could share your public key with anyone you wanted. They could use that to decrypt the information and then you would decrypt it with your private key. From this innovation, public key cryptography, came a whole cascade of other innovations in the field of cryptography. And Tim May and Eric Hughes, they discussed, they started, they discussed the potential of this. And they started to paint pictures of the futures and, and, and how interesting this was and what it all made possible. However, they also recognized no one was actually using it. So these proposals existed in the realm of universities. 
technical papers, uh, conferences maybe, but no one was using it because there was no actual software to use it with. They decided it was time to change that. So they called up another friend of theirs, John Gilmore, who worked at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who was also interested in this kind of technology. And in the three of them, they invited more friends, hackers, cryptographers, privacy activists in the Bay Area, about two dozen of them. They came together at Eric Hughes' house and they founded the Cypherpunks. So the Cypherpunks set out to protect privacy in a digital age. The internet was going to be big, they predicted, but people need to have privacy. So, they wanted to protect privacy in a digital age. How did they plan to do that? Oh yeah, this, okay. <laughs> One more note before that, before we get there. Uh, they also had a mail, so they started, to, they, they first met in person with like 20 of them. Then they started a mailing list. From that point on, anyone, anywhere in the world could join the conversation. So, and it is included hackers, cryptographers, uh, privacy activists, but also CEOs of companies, tech startups, journalists. At its peak, there were like 2,000 people sort of discussing these kinds of technologies. So, how did they want to realize privacy in a digital age? By writing code. So they weren't going to go into politics or lobby politicians or anything like that. No, they were going to actually develop code that would allow people to protect their privacy. So some of the tools they developed were, they, they developed encryption tools, so PGP, pretty good privacy, is a good example of that. Phil, Hammer, uh, Phil Zimmerman's uh, projects for uh, yeah, encrypting information, communicating privately. They also developed remailers, so this allowed people to email each other while obfuscating their metadata, so you wouldn't necessarily know who was emailing who or even who was emailing you. And indeed they wanted to create digital cash. So like physical cash, Digital cash would allow people to pay each other anonymously. You wouldn't need to know who's paying you, and there's no one that can sort of see who's paying who or who owns what or any of that. So this privacy future of physical cash, they wanted to create that for the digital world. Uh, around the same time, the US government actually started to push back against strong cryptography. And the cyberpunks, in turn, start to fight back against that. So the US government wanted to limit the export of strong uh, cryptography. Phil Zimmerman, the, the creator of PGP, he came under investigation for that. Uh, and the cyberpunk started to fight back by creating tools, by creating... Oh no, the slides are gone again. By creating cyberpunk tools. Yeah, okay, slides back, good. Uh, and also for other forms of activism. So this is a t-shirt Adam Beck uh, produced and sold. So it has the RSA encry uh, encryption on it, the, the, the protocol on it, printed. The idea was if you wear this t-shirt and you leave the United States, you're technically a weapons exporter to sort of highlight the absurdity of these, re of, of these regulations. Uh, th this is a quote that I think very well encapsulated the cypherpunk philosophy, so I'll read it out loud. There has never been a government that didn't sooner or later try to reduce the freedom of its subjects and gain more control over them. And there probably never will be one. Therefore, instead of trying to convince our current government not to try, we'll develop the technology, like remailers and decash, that will make it impossible for the government to succeed. So, cyberpunks write code. Uh, there was also a subsection of the cypherpunks that had an even more radical vision. They, so Tim May was the, so one of the founders of the cypherpunks. He, he sort of spearheaded this vision. And he saw uh, these cryptographic tools really as a... He, he saw society as a cro at a crossroads. There were two futures, he said. There's one future without strong cryptography. In such a future, it would be like an Orwellian panopticon. Anything you do on the internet, any message you send, any transaction you make, any website you visit, it can all be monitored, analyzed, censored, etc. The other, the other version of the future, there are strong cryptography tools, and he thought that would completely change society. It would undermine the ability of governments to function. For one, with digital cash, people could easily evade taxes. They would no longer, they, they could hide what their income, they could hide what they own. <laughs> Here, applause for that as well. Yeah, you can applaud. Um, yeah, also leaking secrets. So uh, if people can anonymously leak state secrets, for example, or even sell them for digital cash, again, this undermines how the state operates. 
and in its stead, people will learn to self-organize on the internet using these cryptographic tools, uh, uh, reputation systems, smart contracts, that sort of stuff. Now, not, not every cypherpunk was necessarily a crypto anarchist, but it did sort of attract attention. It was sort of an ideological core in a way. Okay. Yeah, so this is another quote by Tim May. Just as the technology of printing altered and reduced the power of medieval guilds in the social power structure, so too will cryptographic methods fundamentally alter the nature of corporations and of government interference in economic transactions. So he, he really saw it as a way to change society. Uh, the cypherpunks did create uh, electronic cash systems as well, and some of them inspired Bitcoin. So eCash was the first one. This was the one that was uh, developed in Amsterdam, where Eric Hughes uh, briefly worked. And this had a very strong focus on privacy. It was a centralized system, but it was very private. Uh, then there was Hashcash, uh, developed by Adam Beck, which used proof of work. So a way to sort of use computing power to create electronic currencies. Oh, I got to rush a bit. Uh, there was Bitgold, which Nick Zabo developed, which used public key cryptography to send proof of work around, to change ownership of it, to, to use it as money. B-Money, interestingly, used the concept where people could... Um, where everyone sort of would keep everyone else honest. Our pal was uh, really leaned on open source software. Okay, so Bitcoin really was a sort of evolution in this in, in, in these steps. Bitcoin is an implementation of White Eyes B money proposal on Cypherpunks in 1998 and Nick Zavos Bitgold proposal, said Satoshi. Uh, and indeed, Bitcoin is a very cypherpunk project. It has all these cypherpunk aspects. There's no leader, it has privacy futures, it's decentralized, it's a non-state currency. And indeed, Satoshi released it by releasing code. He released the code for everyone to use. So it's a cypherpunk project in that sense. Uh, this is a quote, but I'm a little bit short on time. No, I'm going to read it anyways. There's not much of interest to many of us if cryptocurrencies just become yet another PayPal, just another bank transfer system. What's exciting is the bypassing of gatekeepers, the exorbitant fee collectors, of middlemen who decide whether WikiLeaks, to pick a time, to pick a time an example, can have donations reach it and to allow people to send money abroad. Attempts to be regulatory friendly will likely kill the main uses for cryptocurrencies, which are just another form of PayPal or Visa. So the point here is, Bitcoin isn't just a, a cypherpunk technology, it's also essential that it is. The cypherpunk values embedded in Bitcoin make it unique, make it valuable in a very real way. So is Bitcoin still cypherpunk? Well, in a way it is, I just pointed out the examples in, in, in all the ways that Bitcoin is in fact cyberpunk. But I do think that uh, the, the narrative has shifted a bit around Bitcoin. So people today, you know, there's a lot of talk about ETFs, people are using regulated exchanges, and even some uh, developers that are building privacy tools are getting into trouble. One more slide. Am I good? Not, not, not really. Um, I think everyone here is really, really locked in. So now seems like the appropriate time to tell them to all buy the Genesis book where they can find out. All right, well, the talk is over anyways. This is the, the last point I'm making. I, I won't read the quote then. Um, but yeah, the point is that the narrative of Bitcoin, the narrative of cyberpunk ideology, of cyberpunk votes is important. People need to know why it is important for Bitcoin and Bitcoiners to truly succeed. Okay, yeah, that really is my time. Uh, the Genesis book... Last slide, I guess. Yeah, there is also an audiobook, the Genesis audiobook, if you will. And I'm doing a signing session of the Genesis book in, I guess, 10 minutes and a signing booth across the room. All right, thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.